Hi, ladies and gents. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, very briefly, just say thank you very much for firstly nominating, then voting to get uh, Michael here today. Um, is a provocative title, Battle of the Sexes, uh, will uh, be his subject matter today. So please welcome to today's uh, Michael Seether Jothy. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I've changed the title, as you can see, but it's, it's essentially the same title. Uh, I've called it Love Hurts. Before I start talking about this, and this is a, an area of research that's been going on in my lab for the last 10, 15 years, I just want to say actually how, um, how touched actually it is to be, um, to be on here, to be with um, 12 exceptionally uh, talented uh, lecturers. So I, I really uh, appreciate that. And you know, a little tear came to my eye when I, when I saw it flash up that I'd got through to the last 12. OK, so love hurts. What I want to do is look at three broad questions. But I'm going to take you through those questions in a, in a, in a journey that's um, slightly unorthodox. So let's start off with question one. Why are biologists interested in extreme phenomena? Why are we obsessed with sex? And why do and how do animals harm each other um, during mating? So these are, the, these are the three big things I'm going to be looking at. The, let's start off with why we're interested in extreme phenomena. There are a whole load of reasons here, and I'm really exploring what uh, selection means and, and how it works. So the first reason we're interested in extreme phenomena is that actually it underpins artificial selection, so the way that we um, interact with the world to make it work for us. And it's what actually allows us to feed the world. So you go from uh, teosint, uh, an ancestral uh, corn, uh, it's a grass, to this in the space of uh, a few thousand years. So that's an example of extreme selection. And it underpins, actually, this process and principle underpins all of the agricultural organisms that we use. So that's a, an example of selecting for extreme um, largeness or, or, or size. But it works the other way as well. Um, we've taken this amazing wild animal and uh, turned it into this. So it's the same process. It's another example of how we can take a, a phenotype, take an organism, and turn it into something extreme that we want to use. And this isn't just about the way it looks. This isn't just about the size, the relative size of these. And that's quite an impressive size difference. It's also about their behavior. You've gone from an incredibly aggressive um, animal to, to something that's actually incredibly passive and, and is, is almost designed to sit in a handbag. When you look at natural selection, you actually see very similar kinds of extremes, but they're not usually manifest in, in a physical form. So these, although these don't look very different, these are two types of plant that are adapted to very, very extreme environments. So the environments they're able to, to live in are very, very different. And that's, of course, because what the, extre the extreme selection here is internal. It's the physiology that allows it to, to live in that environment. So not very impressive. But when we get onto sex, the whole thing changes. When you look at systems involved in sex or with sex, you see really bizarre, incredibly extreme forms of adaptation. Here's a female of this uh, particular uh, bird of paradise. And she looks very similar to all other females from most other birds of paradise. Brown, cryptic, um, difficult to spot in the canopy. The male, on the other hand, has this um, absurd plumage, which he displays in an equally absurd behavior. So incredibly visible in this environment, and really an example of something very, very extreme. Now, this was something that got Darwin thinking, and it's actually observations look clearly traits like this are not adaptations to survival. They're traits that are designed to help organisms garner mates. I don't want to make all my examples birds. Here is a particularly amazing little jumping spider, the female on your left, the male on your right. And when things get um, going, 
the male um, flips into that state uh, equally spectacular and equally absurd. And these kinds of extreme forms and traits are found across the whole animal kingdom. So here's another bird of paradise. Um, you see here's a, here's a red deer stag, um, really very different to the female in phenotype. These kinds of traits you find in insects in the same sorts of variety, so fighting traits in this horn beetle, courtship traits in these damselflies, and um, in fish, and the list goes on and on. It actually even extends into the fossil record where there are examples of these kinds of dichotomies. So that's partly why we're obsessed with, with sex, because it produces these incredibly extreme forms of organisms. And, and that's interesting from approximate sense. It's interesting because we want to know, uh, we want to understand something about these spectacular traits. And it's kind of what drives most people into biology in the first place. And there are good academic reasons for looking at this as well. Um, as scientists, we seek explanations, generic explanations that encompass the full range of adaptations that we see from the mundane to the extreme. And so anything that can cope with explaining why you see these extreme forms also has to explain why you have uh, mundane forms. And those explanations often give us real insight into phenomena that, that actually at, at first glance don't make sense. And that's what I'm kind of going to explore today. So I want to, I want to have a look at how understanding how males and females interact to produce those kinds of very obvious extreme traits can explain some things that actually don't make sense. The traditional view of how males and females interact during sex um, was like this about 10 years ago. So the idea was that there was a synergism between male and female interests, um, that uh, despite whatever differences there might be in ecology, uh, and territoriality, when they got together, when the sexes got together to mate, they were getting together to produce offspring that was in both of their interests, and so it would be some kind of cooperative process. That's essentially what I was taught as an undergraduate. In the last 10 years, that 10, 15 years, that view has shifted, actually, quite dramatically. Now, it's shifted because, actually, we, we understand a little bit more deeply what drives these differences between males and females, and fundamentally, it's the difference in investment between sperm and eggs, between the sexes. So males produce uh, a lot of sperm, and females produce a few very precious eggs. And that, that is really what's driving everything I'm about to tell you today. This synergy of interests notion is, is wrong, because actually the investment that the sexes make into their gametes is fundamentally different. Now, I showed you a couple of cuddling cats. Um, the evolutionary reality for species is that it looks more like this. So the sexes are tethered together. They both have to get together in order to mate. But they're looking in very different directions. What they're looking for in this interaction are quite different. The males are looking in one direction and the females are looking in the other. And that's an important, there's two important aspects here, the fact they're looking in different directions and yet they're still tethered together. So whenever you get interactions between organisms that rely on each other, that they're tethered together but they have different interests, you get very interesting biological outcomes. And of these, the most interesting are arms races. So an arms race in biology is exactly the same as an arms race in geopolitics, you start with a simple but useful design, and you very rapidly change that in a short space of time into something quite unrecognizable from where it came from. So that, that change has happened from balsa wood and brown paper to carbon fiber and advanced computing has happened in one generation. I mean, that's an astonishing change in technology there on the screen. But the same kinds of changes happen in biology. Rapid coevolutionary change happens in viruses. The reason you get colds and flus every year is that the viruses are con constantly evolving to find ways of getting around your immune system. Um, occasionally, they evolve ways that are absolutely devastating. So at the turn of the century, Spanish flu killed millions of people. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the problems uh, potential problems of things like uh, swine flu and bird flu. Those are all emergent um, 
properties of uh, mutational changes in, in flu virus. And because these organisms are so small, they can change very, very quickly. And here's another host-parasite interaction. Uh, this is the plasmodium that causes malaria. And again, you see a very rapid evolutionary arms race between the host and the parasite. It's not manifest as amazing um, physical change in the organism, but it is manifest in amazing molecular and physiological changes. So how is, conf how is this conflict of interests manifest in the sexes? And I should say at this point that the change that's happened, the change from this view of, of cuddling cats to tethered goats, that, that view, that change in perspective has actually, what it's saying is that the interaction between the sexes is like the host-parasite interaction. What we expect to see here are very rapid evolutionary changes as males and females interact in evolutionary time. So what's driving this is uh, the different reproductive interests, which in turn are, are driven, as I've already said, by the difference in investment between sperm and eggs. Male fitness is enhanced by mating frequency. Males can produce millions and millions of sperm in most organisms, and so if the more mating partners they have, the more offspring they leave, the higher their fitness. So that's one of the core driving features behind male interests in, in biology. By contrast, female fitness is very rarely enhanced by multiple mating. So if a if female mates with, with 10 males or with 20 males, there'll be very little increase in her fitness because her fitness is driven by the number of eggs that she can lay. So females are driven by um, fecundity, by how, how, how good their eggs are at surviving. So there's two very different, uh, those two different perspectives drive things in a very different way. And the conflict um, that that disparity uh, produces is manifest in some incredibly diverse forms of mating adaptation, which until the last decade or so have remained a puzzle to biologists. We haven't really understood why you see these incredible adaptations. So what I want to do uh, in the next few minutes is take you through five different examples of bizarre mating adaptations that about 10, 15 years ago made no sense. And actually, there were very few explanations for how and why these things occurred. But, but they actually now illustrate very nicely the outcome of these conflicts of interests between males and females. The five examples are all from research done in my lab or with collaborators or people who've come through my lab at some point. So the first one is Drosophila. This is a standard um, biological model. It's one that, um, it's an organism that we've been studying for almost a century now, and it's probably the best studied um, organism on the planet. A few years ago, an American team uh, and, a, and a UK team discovered that males transfer to females in their ejaculate, transfer a protein and a, a series of proteins that adjust the way the female makes and lays her eggs. So males that transmit this protein, what the, pro what the protein does is it makes females lay eggs much faster and it makes them um, produce those eggs in a much shorter space of time. Now the reason that this benefits males is that if, if you can change, if, if as a male you can elevate the female's egg laying rate, you will end up fertilizing more eggs than if she laid it at the rate that she was designed to lay eggs at. So it's selected, this behavior, this physiology is selected in males because it drives egg laying rate in females, which means they end up fertilizing more eggs. So that's, that's quite an incredible piece of, of, um, of, of biology. It turns out that the, the co-evolutionary arms race that's going on between males and females in this kind of protein space is happening very, very rapidly. But that's not what I want to focus on today. It also turns out, uh, five years ago, a Japanese colleague discovered that across uh, a whole species group of Drosophila, that they were doing something else as well. So don't, uh, this is a, a rather complicated slide. Um, what it shows is across the top row, are the female genital tracts of virgin females. Each vertical, sorry, each row is a different species. The top column, I've got that the wrong way around. Those are columns, those are rows. The columns are species. The top row are virgin females. The second row are 
once mated females, the genital tracts. And the red arrows that you can see are pointing to areas that we know indicate damage to the genital tract. And what you see on the bottom row are pictures of line drawings of the male genitalia with the red arrows pointing to the areas that are causing that damage. So male, the point, there's two points to take home from this picture. One is that the best studied organism in the planet, we only discovered this aspect, this bizarre aspect of its mating biology about seven years ago. And at first, nobody believed this. Everyone thought this was just some artifact. But it turns out this was Kamimura's paper a few years ago. He's since produced several papers that show this is incredibly widespread. So why, why are males doing this? Well, it turns out that if you transmit an, a protein in your ejaculate, it has to diffuse across the female's genital tract into her bloodstream to become active. It has to move across a whole load of barriers. If you punch a hole through that, it goes straight into the bloodstream. And that's almost certainly what's driving these adaptations. Now, it's not beneficial for the female to have holes punched in the genital tract and to have a mating rate elevated, but it does benefit the male. Now, females respond to this kind of selection. We're not quite sure how yet, but they, they will be responding to this kind of selection. And I'll show you an example later on that shows one adaptation in a, in a different organism. So that's Drosophila. And here is, are some pictures taken by a master's student in my lab. Uh, these are a pair of male and female Drosophila uh, mating that have been frozen in flagranti delecto, and the red bit shows you the, the prongs that are causing this genital damage. So I'll, I'll get rid of the prongs and you, you can just see the outline. So it's quite a fearsome structure there, designed to puncture and hold on to the female during mating. Okay, example number two, turbolarian flatworms. Um, this work was done by a German colleague called Nico Michiels. Uh, he, he started this work in my lab and went to work in, in Germany, uh, in, um, I can't remember where, but uh, in Munster, I think, and, and produced this piece of work, which is absolutely astonishing. When Nico set out to do this, he thought, and many of us thought, that if you look at organisms where males and female interests are embedded in the same individual. So these flatworms are simultaneous hermaphrodites. They have male and female, active male and female parts together, that you would see less of a problem with conflict, that you would only see conflict between in species where you had separate sexes. It turns out to be completely the opposite. The expression of conflict is much greater in hermaphrodite species for reasons we don't fully understand. Turbolarian flatworms are faced with a problem. They have to find a mate. They can't self-fertilize, so they have to find someone to mate with, even though they have simultaneously male and female parts. So what they do is they pretend to be female, because females are the limiting resource. They're the ones with the precious resource, which are eggs. So when two flatworms approach, they pre both pretend to be female. And as they get closer, they take on the male role. And the consequence of that is two flatworms that look like they're dancing. What they're actually doing is fencing with their penises. So these are two, these are their, they have bifurcated penises, these are the penises, and what they're trying to do is to stab the other flatworm whilst at the same time avoid being stabbed themselves. They want to take on the male role and they want to avoid being the female. Here, the individual on the left has managed to stab the individual on the right who's still left flailing around impotently, literally, and that one has been inseminated. Now, the, the point here is this individual has now achieved some fitness. It's fertilized a uh, recipient, and it can go off and continue to try and be in the male role. The problem for this one, at least, is it now has to invest in its eggs, in producing those eggs, so it has to take on more of a female role. Eggs are expensive to produce. It has to spend more time foraging to grow those eggs. So flatworms try not to be female for as long as possible until, it, until that decision is kind of made for them by losing out in this uh, game of penis fencing. So that's uh, example number two. Example number three is a beetle. If you're a vegetarian or if you keep uh, or are interested in black-eyed peas as a food source and you buy organic ones, if you've ever left a bag of black-eyed peas in the back of a drawer and find them a few months later, they'll probably be crawling with, with this little beetle. So there's a black-eyed pea. 
and there's Callus abrucus. They burrow into the, the larvae burrow into the bean and they hatch out as adults where they mate, lay eggs on the beans, and then the whole cycle starts again. Now, Callus abrucus is a very small, uh, innocuous little beetle, um, but if you uh, examine the male's reproductive um, organ, it's a pretty ferocious looking thing. So here's a male, um, here's the Ediagus, uh, and from here upwards is what enters the female genital tract. So if we have a look at that in close-up, it's a pretty ferocious um, instrument. These are sclerotized, these are hard, sharp spines, and they wound the female genital tract in a fairly um, ferocious way during mating. So why is the male deliberately wounding the female? There are several answers to this, but at a kind of ultimate level, the consequence of wounding the female is that she doesn't remate as soon as she would if she wasn't, mate, if she wasn't wounded. And if she doesn't remate, it means the only sperm she has to fertilize her eggs is the sperm of the male who wounded her. So this kind of selection favors the evolution of traits like this, that although they act against the female's best interests, they're driven by selection because they're favored in males. I'm going to get on now to uh, my current favorite examples. I'm going to give you two examples of these organisms. Um, this is the common bed bug, uh, Cymex lectularius. And um, the common bed bug is interesting because it has a quite a highly co-evolved system of mating. And, th and this is an example of what we call traumatic insemination. I'm not suggesting that the previous example wasn't traumatic. But, but this one is a more co-evolved system. So here are a pair of mating bed bugs flipped over. And there's something wrong. There are several things wrong with this picture. Um, one is that the, this is the female. And the female has a fully functional reproductive tract. Here's a gonopore. Here's, that's where she lays her eggs through. She has a single genital tract, which splits into two oviducts and has ovaries, standard insect setup. But the male isn't using it. Instead, the male is stabbing with this little pin-like structure here, is stabbing through her cuticle and inseminating into her body cavity. That white, whitish, whitish patch under the cuticle there is um, ejaculate going into the female's body cavity. So although the female has a reproductive tract, the male doesn't use it. Instead, he stabs through a cuticle with an ediagus, a penis, that looks like this. It looks like a hypodermic needle. In fact, if you see electron micrographs of snake fangs or hypodermic needles, they look very, very similar to this. And that's because this is a very efficient design for stabbing and injecting um, viscous fluid uh, into, into body cavities. So th here's the Ediagus, and it's a beautifully designed structure. So what happens during mating? Here's a, here's a pair in the normal mating position. What happens during mating is the male inseminates sperm into this organ here. Now this is a unique organ to this group. And I, I flagged up earlier on that we're trying to understand more about how females respond to this. Females, females we don't expect females to take this um, lying down. There, there should be some evolutionary response. And this is the way that bedbug females have responded. They've evolved this organ. This is unique to this group. What it is essentially is an immune organ. It's a, it's a structure that's full of immune cells. And it's always positioned over the site where the male stabs the female. So the, male, the female encourages the male to stab her in one place. And that's presumably a way to manage the damage. It's the damage limitation exercise in evolutionary terms. If he just stabbed her anywhere, that would cause all sorts of problems. By making him stab in one place, and placing this structure over it, she, she limits the effects of infection and the damage that's caused during mating. But here's the, here's the really, it gets, it gets even more bizarre. The sperm are injected into this structure, and they then swim out through the bottom. They swim through her blood and penetrate through the outside of her existing genital tract. They then go into storage in these little structures on the side. And sometime later, through a mechanism we don't understand, they swim out, swim up her oviducts, and fertilize an egg up there. So this whole system has evolved 
from some ancestor that used the genital, the genital tract in the normal way. Exactly how that happened, exactly what drove that, we, we have absolutely no idea. But this whole group um, only mates like this. Every single representative in this group shows this kind of mating pattern. Now, being stabbed is, is bad enough, but just think about the logistics here. The female is, is having sperm pumped into her body cavity and it's swimming through her blood. Okay, that presents all sorts of immunological issues. And you might think, okay, it's not a big deal if it's only 10 sperm or 100 sperm. What I'm showing you here is a female that's been dissected after one mating cycle. And she's, uh, we've, we've killed her and we've taken the top off her abdomen, we've removed the gut, all the, all the gubbins that are going to get in the way for you to see what I want you to see have gone. And these structures here, so I'll show you on this one, these light blue colored structures are her ovaries. These are the structures that she's invested her resource into fitness. Okay, that's how she gets evolutionary fitness. Very important structures, and that's, that's how much energy and, and effort and material she's invested. These structures down here in red are those sperm storage organs filled with sperm after one mating cycle. It's five times the amount of tissue as her ovaries. And those mating cycles happen every week and a bedbug female in the adult form can live for up to a year. So just think about the logistics there. She's not only having to deal with being stabbed in the, in the belly, she's also having to deal with a, a phenomenal volume of, of sperm, far more, far in excess of, excess of what she can use. And exactly how they do that, we have no idea. Exactly how she gets rid of all this sperm, because she doesn't use it all, we, we have no idea. So bedbug females are, are faced with um, a, 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 actually a threefold problem. The third problem I haven't told you about is infection during mating, and they've, but they've responded to that by evolving this immune, this immune organ. Okay. So I now want to um, look at another bedbug species but the reason I'm tagging this one on the back of, of this one, this is the kind of standard setup. The one I'm about to show you shows you what can, what can go wrong or what, can, what unexpectedly can pop out of selection once you've gone down this kind of route. So this is um, an African bat bug. This is not a bed bug. Um, it's, it's a much bigger organism. I'll show you a scale comparison in a second. Uh, Aphrocymix constrictus. It's only known from three caves in Kenya. Uh, those caves are on the side of Mount Elgin National Park on the Kenyan-Ugandan border. Um, you may already know about these caves. These are famous because elephants go in there to scrape minerals off the walls, salt-bearing minerals, um, which, they, which they eat. So doing field work here is, is, um, is, is interesting. The caves are, are huge. They have to be big enough, obviously, to let elephants get in. That's the cave mouth. It's one of my co-workers standing in it. And it's full of bats. It's full of Egyptian fruit bats. Egyptian fruit bats are interesting. They're the only fruit bats that, that roost um, in caves. Most fruit bats roost in trees. And consequently, you can have areas with very large colonies of fruit bats. And that's almost certainly why this particular bat bug has, the, it's, it's exclusive to this host. It will only feed on Egyptian fruit bats and it's only found in caves where you have long established colonies of Egyptian fruit bats. So here it is for scale. This is Cymex lectularius, uh, the common bed bug. It's about the size of an apple pip, uh, maybe just a little bit smaller, and that's Aphrocymex constrictus. Okay, it's a very different beast. It's a big, spidery, active, very, very mobile um, organism. Now, we came back with, uh, from our first expedition with, uh, with a whole load of bugs that we wanted. What we originally set out to look at was how the, the, the female structures all lay together, because we knew this one had, had a slightly odd structure. So we had a very talented uh, master's student putting them into piles. And his first pile was to put males and females. His first task was to put males and females into a pile, and then go through the females to see whether there was a way of gauging how often they'd mated or, or been traumatically inseminated. 
So here's a virgin female, and what the line drawing here shows you is these, these two black areas uh, are, the, are the areas where the male uh, stabs the female. So in all bedbugs, bar one very primitive species, the, male will, the female always localizes the stabbing to one place. So she gets, only gets stabbed in these two places. So here's a virgin female, and here's a female who's been mated multiple times. You can see the, you can see the scar tissue here is manifest as this dark black melanic um, scar tissue. And because we think the reason she has two of these structures is because actually one, once one gets really badly scarred, it becomes inaccessible. And so the male moves on to the next one. So here's, we can, the, the point I'm making with this slide is you can judge how often a female's been mated by the extent of this scar tissue. And we'll come on to that in a second. The other thing that Ewan did as he was putting them into piles was he noticed something really weird. Here's our female, here's the, here's the female I've just shown you, and here's a, a, a standard female, and you can see some of the scarring here, the black structures inside here. And here's a male. The line drawing shows you the ediagus, the penis, but you will notice that all the males also had similar kinds of structures to the females. So now it starts getting odd. We've got a female who has a normal genital tract, and she has, but the males don't use it, they use this weird other root. And that root we call the paragenital tract. It's, it functions as the genitalia, but she still has genitalia. So paragenitalia is the way we've coped with that. But the male also has female paragenitalia. And not only does he have these external manifestations, he also has that big immune-filled sac underneath it. And the other thing that happened, as Ewan was pulling his uh, animals out of the, out of the um, uh, tubes that we'd stored them in and putting them into piles. He noticed that we had, I'll come on to this in a second, he noticed that there were females that also had different forms of this external um, structure. In fact, their external structure looked more like the male ones. So let's just come back to that in a second. First thing I want to make clear or, or show you, so here's a scanning electron micrograph of that area. And in the female-like females, so I should say, how do we define a female-like female? This is going to get complicated. But a female-like female has an external structure that is very similar to close relatives. And close relatives all look something like this. And if you look at it under the scanning EM, sorry, the, the quality here is a little bit weak, you can see a straight margin and actually very few hairs going across it. If you look at the male form, what you see is a scalloped margin with, with a lot of hairs going across that scallop. So why is this important? We need to take a step back. All of the mating happens in the dark. So this is a very tactile organism. And males will only mate with freshly fed females when they're expanded with blood, when they're full of blood. So they turn into kind of blood balloons. So in the dark, the way a male tells whether he's going to mate with a female or whether he's got a potential mate is, is feeling this large um, blood-filled female. But of course, males have to feed on blood as well. And when they feed on blood, they also turn into large blood-filled males. So in the dark, they feel very similar to females. And because they're relatively rare in the environment, what you have, what's been selected for here is what's called um, a scramble competition mating system, which essentially means shoot first, ask questions later. And what that means is that in the dark, males are just as likely to get mounted as are females. So if you're going to get stabbed and you don't have that immune organ, you're going to die very quickly. So males are selected to have the female paragenitalia, but at the same time, they don't want to look like females. They want to, they want to make it seem different. They, they, there may be a last call, that guy that's about to shoot is, might, might have paid enough attention to realize he's on the, on, the wrong, uh, on the wrong gender here. So they make this external bit, which is the last port of call before everything uh, becomes irretrievable, they make it ta tactile, very different to this one. It's scalloped and, 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 and very hairy, whereas this is flat and very smooth. So what's going on here? Well, we know from other insects that wherever you have scramble competition, in, in many insects with scramble competition, you get uh, what's called gynandrism. 
So you often get females that have male-like coloration or male-like form. And what that means is when they go to a mating site, they don't get harassed as badly as females that look like females. With scramble competition, the sex ratio means you've got a lot of males searching for females. If you're, if you're a mateable female, you're, a, you're in a very bad sex ratio disadvantage. There are lots of males around. So, the, so selection favors females that look like males, and they just get avoided. Males don't, aren't interested. So we think what's happening here, our idea was that by pretending to have male-like genitalia, these females were avoiding being stabbed as frequently as these females. So let me just run you through this again. We've got females who have normal genitalia and female paragenitalia, girls who are girls. We have boys who are girls. And we have girls, sorry, we have boys who are girls, but with a boy-like girl, girly bit. And we have girls who have boy-like girly bits. OK? And we think, our hypothesis is that this form is selected because they avoid getting stabbed. So what they're, trying to, what they're doing is avoid the costs of being mated as much as this one. It's very difficult to test this. Um, but, but actually, because they're scars, because they leave scars every time they mate, we can go back and look at the scarring and see whether it maps onto this idea. So I'm going to show you some data. It's the only data I'm going to show you today. What you've got at the side here is a scarring index. And basically, if it's 0, it means you have no scars, so that's pristine, all the way up to, to 1, which is fully black, like that, the one I showed you before, 0.6 here, which is different levels of scarring. And what we're going to look at is the level of scarring in comparably caught males. That's a male on the left. These are our male-like females, and these are our female-like females. So if you look at the scarring in males, they don't get away, they don't get away with, with it. They, get, they, get, they have a level of scarring. It's a fairly low level. Our male-like females, our male-like females have actually have higher levels of scarring than our female-like males. It's significantly different, but it's also significantly lower than the female-like females. So our female-like females get the worst damage. So this kind of maps onto our explanation. So in summary, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie up now. In summary, sexual selection results in extreme traits. That's why biologists are interested in extreme traits. They usually, they usually work on sexual selection. And sex, the mere fact of sex predisposes organisms to, to conflicts. It generates, sex of itself generates conflicts that we're only just beginning to understand the dynamic of. And as far as the interaction between males and females goes, that conflict has produced some of the most interesting and bizarre adaptations in genitalia. Thank you.